The remains found in a Bronze Age barrow not far from Stonehenge, known as Upton Lovell G2A, have long been seen as portraying the main occupant of the burial as a shaman. But is that really who he was? It is said the way you look at something changes the thing you're looking at, and now it seems that a new study of the so-called Upton Lovell shaman tells a much more nuanced and exciting story. Stay with us, and we'll do our best to tell you why that is. Once again, modern laboratory techniques have been applied to excavations carried out long ago, resulting in some truly remarkable discoveries. Now, Upton Lovell, only around eight miles from Stonehenge, is home to a number of burials, and this research focuses on one of them, Burial G2A, the burial evocatively known as the Upton Lovell Shaman. I think it's fair to say that we're always drawn to what we might call the... Um the prehistory of the personal. Is that not so, mm. Mr. Soskin? <laughs> I think that is a very fair description. Yeah, what, I mean, what really fires us up is when archaeological finds point towards the actual lives that people lived. And I think this is one of those cases, especially given the way this particular archaeological paper that we're looking at sets out to reframe some of the assumptions that previous interpretations of this burial were based on. In very broad terms, what we have here is an excavation that was first carried out in the very early 1800s by William Cunnington, later appraised and interpreted in the 1930s and the 1960s, most particularly by Stuart Piggott, and is now the subject of the 2022 paper we've been looking at by Rachel Krellin and colleagues. So what the paper's trying to do is reappraise earlier ideas of identities attached to the burial, such as shame and and metal worker, gold worker, what have you, and focus um, more on the process and the materials uh, and the, the actions that may have been taking place. This may sound a bit esoteric and airy-fairy, but the study is enabled by modern microware and scanning electron microscope techniques that can uncover such subtle things as, as polishing and hammering and smoothing actions that are recorded on the stone tools. Um, mm. I mean, that, that lays it out pretty simply, but of course we're going to get a bit more complicated than that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> we are. Well, it, it is fascinating, isn't it? Because, you know, they have been able to look at this, this whole assemblage of items that came out of the burial. Mm. And, and previously, you know, you, you would have looked at say, cobbles, you know, rounded, uh, you know, uh, water-worn stones as, uh, as you know, okay, uh, part of a toolkit, but doing what? Yeah. And this research has actually shown, they've been able to microscopically see that there are flakes of gold or, uh, or just different aspects of wear and tear on different edges. It's amazing how they've been able to say mm -hmm. that a copper all for example that they can tell what sort of surface it was used against yeah. because of the type of wear and impact that it has uh, um that it's been subjected to yeah it just completely changes the way you would interpret a toolkit it does i mean and just to reiterate as well you know that we're dealing with something that was at first excavated in 1801 to uh, 81 through to 1801 eight, and 1803, 1803 i think it wasn't it yeah 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 i mean uh, this is alongside you know so many other uh, excavations that were taking around um, taking place on uh, barrows apparent in the landscape that needed explanation mm. in the 19th century um but of course Archaeological standards weren't the same, so um, all that previous archaeologists have been dealing with, and I mentioned Stuart Piggott uh, in the 1930s and 60s, uh, have been mm. dealing with is the written report. And it's not really that. Uh, not, it's not an archaeological no, not really. report. It's, it's a sort of mm. diary mention of, of what, <laughs> uh, yes. what happened. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great shame mm. that there are no illustrations left, uh, if there were any, uh, there are no illustrations left from that original burial. So we don't know. There were actually two bodies in this barrow, one on top of uh, of the other, in separate burials. And all these artefacts are, 
associated with the primary burial. Mm. But the trouble is that because there are no illustrations, there are just the descriptions, that it's very difficult to uh, to really look at it, certainly, you know, in the way that uh, archaeologists would interpret it, mm. you know, with modern eyes. Um, mm. You know, so it's trying to piece it together from, as Mike said, with those descriptions. Well, also the fact that... Uh, um, although mentioned in the earliest report by William Cunnington, it's se- and this fact seems to have been glossed over rather in later reports, and that is we're not talking about a single burial. There were two people in this burial. Mm. Gender, we think, unspecified, but there's yeah. uh, one burial on top of another. And the, the, the title, Shaman, for some reason, has always been been um, applied to the first burial, the lower lower burial. I think the assumption is that they were buried at the same time, one on top of the other. But we, <clears throat> uh, not because without the context, it's even not possible to um, it, ascertain. It's probably that fact. all probably also worth mentioning that the primary burial, so the lower one, mm. uh, was lying down. Yeah. And the one above was, uh, it's uh, believed, was buried in a seated position. So I uh, don't know what the relevance of that is, but clearly it was, uh, it was significant. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we have to look to other reports of other burials for that because the the, the crouched mm. position, seated position burial is is fairly. Mm. Uh, um, fairly well, it, re- it reminded me, without going off on one, it reminded me of the, the again, shaman under the skate part, yes. uh, <laughs> not so far away, Yeah, where whilst they weren't one on top of the other, there was the primary burial, um, uh, which was lying down under a, a hoof and hide uh, covering, and not far away from him... Uh, was uh, was a seated burial, so there does seem to be this relationship between people uh, interred in the same burial. That's quite interesting. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, there's not much we can say about that further because there aren't any particular details. But the artifacts found in the burial have been associated primarily with the first burial uh, because yeah. um, the uh, bone pieces, the bone, sharpened bone, the, the whole b- bone, and those accoutrements have always all found, were found round about his legs and, uh, uh, and mm. uh, you know, in the lower part of his body, mostly round about his legs for some strange reason. Yeah, feet and, so, feet and legs, yeah. And so we have a portrait, you know, a very fine portrait. I've used it in the... Um, in the thumbnail for this show, so we have a, a, a portrait which is actually comes from the display in the Wiltshire Museum, which you must go and look at actually with fresh eyes, and because uh, mm. uh, uh, we bypassed it a bit because we're sort of drawn to the Bush Barrow display, I think, and all the gold, and probably missed out on the guy that made well, the something <laughs> yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah. With them making of but it. But isn't it interesting though? You you saying that going back with you know looking with uh, with new eyes. Mm. That how many times have we walked past, um, well, museum exhibits all over the place where there have been this arrangement of cobbles that have been found in burials mm. and, uh, and almost just, you know, just don't, just, okay, it's an interesting thing that was in the, is it an interesting thing? Something that was in the burial. Never thought about it in terms of metalworking. It's a complete game changer, this uh, this piece of research. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's also very interesting, the the range of artefacts that were found. So whether it was uh, awls or boar's tusks. Um, uh, uh, boar's tusks, they're a particularly interesting thing because uh, they've been looking at the awls, so these basically copper pins, really, Um bigger than pins, but um, but seeing those in terms of how they would have been used in shaping yeah. uh, metal, you know, if you can, if, so <clears throat> creating ridges mm. maybe mm. Uh, in metal using these tools. And so that then uh, opens up a series of questions of, uh, you know, are these tusks and teeth and things like that that you find, well, are they also different ways of, uh, of making marks or shaping 
metal and are they less to do with the adornments on uh, you know on the person's costume and more yeah. to do with part of the toolkit yeah yeah shall we talk about um well actually before we get away from that can, have we got a rough breakdown of what was found in the grave what these tools we're talking about are uh, oh heavens do you want to go through the table uh, no, Shall not I really. Just, just a, just a broad a... thing because we, we've <laughs> got, we've got um, uh, bone points um, which uh, have been uh, perforated. Uh, we've got uh, bore the perforated tusks. and yeah, and unperforated. Now that, that in itself is interesting. You know, uh, some on the costume and some not on the costume. Uh, we've got yeah. stone battle axes, broken and unbroken, and mm. we've got a flint uh, flint axe. And we've got little flint cups, amongst other things. So, it's a, yeah. you know, it's a fascinating collection of stuff. But should we go back? Well, there's, uh, there's, there's also on. things that, that, aren't, um, that aren't related to what we could interpret as the toolkit. And, I mean, there are things like um, there's a, a, a belt ring made of jet, there's a jet bead, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. there's bone beads, there's various things that would have been part of the costume. Mm. But... Um, uh, but yes, it's. I, I find the battle axe thing really interesting because mm. you, you then come around to this thing of what well, if they've shown from looking at the axes and stones in this burial, which that, they, uh, they, which they sh- have. That, I mean, which was, yes. you know, we haven't addressed this yet, but yes, it was. So, so they they've shown that they've been used as tools. Yeah. And so that that then raises the question, well, hold on. These amazingly highly polished axes, greenstone axes that came from the Swiss Alps and things like that, polished to an almost mirror surface. You think, well, was the reason for them being so highly polished because they're being used in metalwork and the more highly polished they are, that means they're not going to scratch, they're not going to leave textures, they get, everything is going to be perfectly smooth. Yeah. Um uh, and then you get the thing with the battle axes, which I find this really evocative because, again, it's unknowable. But why would you use a battle axe? Is it because uh, they believed that in using a battle axe in the creation of this piece of metal, hmm. that you were actually transferring the spirit of the owner or maybe of the axe itself, if people believed that the uh, the tools themselves, the weapons themselves had a... A, a spirit, maybe that you, you're, you're actually putting that spirit into the item that you're creating. That's a really well, yeah. uh, evocative the, possibility. The, spirit, the history of it, the story of it, whether it was known mm. or unknown, its its previous use um, must transfer, or maybe transfers something to the work. I just wanted to to you know backtrack before we got into too much uh, detail there as to how it you know he became known as the upton level shaman and this is the whole point of this paper you know it's moving because as soon as we call somebody a shaman a metal worker a gold worker you know which is what came out of uh, Stuart Piggott's uh, s- studies, once we've done that, we've rather fixed them in terms of our understanding of what a shaman is, which may be completely skew whiff away from what he was really uh, up to. And that's the point of this paper. You know, it's really looking at what, what was happening with the materials and, 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 uh, what they can discern through the electron microscopy, um, you know how those surfaces were used against each other and with with metal um, to shape and form. So I just wanted to mention this thing: the oddity about how he was described as a shaman. Look, we're talking about a Bronze Age. Is known it was a Bronze Age gentleman or woman, whatever you know, because as I said. Uh, the, the agenda has not been applied because the study has that part of the study has not uh, been done on the uh, on the bones but what happened was um because of the the what was interpreted as dress you know the boar tusks and the bones and s- stuff immediately um um burials on the continent of 
uh, people that there had been interpreted as shamans because of the similarity with the tusks and the, you know, whatever, teeth and dangly bits and, and bones on their costumes have been interpreted as. But why, when you've got a Bronze Age, you know, fella with um, uh, metal all, all around him, are you going back to Mesolithic hunter-gatherer burials to interpret it in the same way? So this cash, this um, identity of a shaman has been plastered on from not only a few thousand miles away, but several thousand years previous. Yeah. When yeah, that in, uh, it's that, quite rash, the link isn't is entirely it? spurious. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted That's to point that out. That's not necessarily to say, and I think it's a very good point to make. And, yeah. it, and obviously it's not necessarily to, uh, to say that it's wrong. It's just that it's, it's a hell of a leap it's to a apply, reach. you know, just because somebody had something <laughs> similar in a burial to something from thousands of years previous, yeah. that it must be the same. Yeah. Um, also interesting that that interpretation was made 200 years ago and, uh, and it's never really been questioned. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, that it was still in place just because of what was interpreted to be clothing. Yeah. Um, I just yeah, wanted to slot in, you know, as we're on this, just slot in a little sidebar here, is that the, the title of the paper in question that we're looking at is Materials in Movement, Gold and Stone in Process in the Upton Lovell G2A Burial, which is variously, you mm. know, has been reported under headlines such as 4,000-year-old shaman burial near Stonehenge as a golden secret, ancient gold from near Stonehenge reveals a glimpse into Bronze Age mystery <laughs> uh, and mythology, etc., and, but just to show how badly, badly journalists sometimes completely miss the point or don't even read the primary source at all, this one. Yeah. Archaeologists identify 4,000-year-old shaman's toolkit near Stonehenge. By now, <laughs> here listening to us, you'll have gathered that uh, that last, whoever wrote that last headline was out to lunch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> But it, it, do you know, the the thing for me from all of this mm -hmm. is that, uh, particularly when you look at the amount of burials there are across the Salisbury Plain, all these barrows yeah. that have been excavated, and and the thing is that uh, we know from uh, uh, people like Richard Colt Hall's descriptions of people being buried in the bare earth, um. Uh, you know, so no fancy burial, just people being buried or, or maybe cremated, what have you, that all the burials that we've looked at historically uh, where um, axes have been found in the burials, for example, it's a common thing hmm. in uh, in barrows that there, there are axes included. Well, do we now have to start reassessing all of these burials? You know, how many metal workers in the Bronze Age, how many metal workers would you have needed to service a reasonable sized community and and are we actually looking at possibly lord knows how many metal workers buried with their toolkits yeah it's uh, it, mm. it is a real good question now um the question for us is <clears throat> uh, have we done um uh, justice to uh, the paper and the intention uh, of the paper and and that is uh, getting round this idea of shifting away from interpreting the people buried with certain implements, have them define who they are by applying words we know, like shame and metal worker, etc. Mm. And how um, instead concentrating on what was actually happening with the materials and, uh, and, and the artefacts themselves, what actual story they tell and it can be mm. different from what our, in our heads the word shaman tells us or metal worker tells us you know about mm. what's going on here i mean I, just before we answer that it, it, thing we've sort of slightly missed out is the fact that um the sort of gold work we're talking about our metal work we're talking about is the application of thin layers of gold over other sub substances or other artifacts to embellish them so we're talking about very fine gold work 
um, with fine decoration. That's the sort of thing that's that's going on here that requires this smoothing and 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 rubbing down uh, and all the kind of um, actions that are uh, t well. That's the story that these implements give through the uh, microware and um, electron microscopy that. Uh, uh, that they've that the uh, they've done, <clears throat> uh, Rachel Krellin, and uh, and colleagues all hail. Uh, mm. Sorry, did I did I ask a question there, or did I just answer it myself? <laughs> I think I think you answered it yourself. Okay. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. It's uh, it, it it's very telling. I think that that people have been interpreted as shaman predominantly because uh, in the past, predominantly because the things like animals' teeth that have been found uh, in their graves, they've been interpreted as all being on their costumes. And that's just how we we have this mental image of shaman as people wearing bits of animals. Mm. And that's pretty much all it's based upon. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's reassess all of that, yeah. I think. I think I'll, mm. I'll put a link to the... Because it's freely available, available, the paper. I'll put a link to the paper in the description... Mm. Um, down below. I mean, one caveat we do have with the paper is that, uh, interestingly, the, the language is quite flowery and romantic <laughs> uh, in, in the way that um, it, mm. it's it's presented and, uh, and couched, which to us was a little off-putting, but we, I think we still get the point. The point is still uh, valid. It's not invalidated by the, some of the choice of, of language, is what I'm saying. <clears throat> Yeah, the the overall interpretations are are solid and mm. extraordinary. Mm. You know, the, the fact that they have been able to show on all these different uh, stones and cobbles that you know even the sorts of movements that have been used repeatedly, uh, you know, to show how they were used. It's it it really is an extraordinary and rigorous piece of research. You know, hats off to them. They've done a fantastic job. Yeah. And doing the sort of work that we love to report on, as I say, right, right at the very top. Mm. You know, this is the prehistory of the of the personal. You can't get more personal, you know, than how things were being used, how things were being processed in 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 the hand, yeah. and, and uh, you know yeah. what um, meaning could be. You know how meaningful maybe the stuff that was going yeah. on uh, was. So there yeah. we are. Um, yeah, I'll leave the link uh, down below um, uh, for, for the, the paper itself. Um, so yeah. actually, by the way, if you've been enjoying this show and other content, you'd like to support the channel, please do visit our Patreon page or our film fundraising page on the Buy Me A Coffee um, uh, page. Uh, link's in the description below. There's also um, the YouTube thanks button, which you should be able to see just under here, which is another easy way to make a contribution should you feel so inclined. And with that said, I don't think there's um, yes. much more to uh, add to that. Uh, um, no, not really. Not not really. I think, uh, but do, if you're interested, you do download the paper because the, yeah. the details in the in the tables, apart from anything else, saying how they've analysed what how things have been used. You know, it's, an, it's a fascinating read. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I recommend that. Um, great. Excellent. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, see you again uh, very, very soon. Hope you enjoyed that. That's bye-bye from me. Yeah, bye-bye from me. See you soon. Bye.